So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm actually covering for John Holiday today. So uh, this is actually his presentation on industrial strength records management in SharePoint 2010. Fortunately, John couldn't be with us. So I do apologize if you're expecting to see John. Unfortunately, you've got me instead. Uh, so with a quick change here. So uh, yes, I'm Pete Mellish. I work for Microsoft Consultancy Services in the UK. Uh, I've been working with SharePoint since SharePoint 2003. Um, essentially, I got into using the records management features within SharePoint 2007. I've run a couple of projects around that. Uh, I'm actually delivering an IW track on records management a bit later on in the day. If you were thinking of coming to that one, I'd suggest that you don't if you're already in this room because we're going to cover probably more in this session than we will in the IW track. Okay. So what are we going to cover in this session today? So we're going to go around and we're going to review what we have within the records management features within 2007. We're then going to go on and to have a look at the evolution that we've got within 2010 and the key features around that. We're also going to take a deep dive into the in-place records management features. And we're also going to understand the 2010 record center and how that can be worked across the entire ecosystem within the organization. So. Back in the old days, I say old in kind of inverted commas here, uh, when we were looking in uh, the 2007 days, um, when we were declaring records, one of the key challenges, how do you identify those records? So it's a visual representation of those records when you're looking at them and say, well, this, this document here has been generated a record. These were elements that weren't baked into the product. There were ways around to actually make these things happen, but it was unobvious to most users that actually something had been declared a record. How do you control those records? So actually, what's the uh, protection that you actually put against the record? How do you understand that? Where do those records sit? And developing file plans. So uh, when you're actually generating file plans, there are some very specific limitations within SharePoint 2007. Uh, we're going to have a look at how SharePoint 2010 has addressed some of these. So, uh, so when we're declaring a record in SharePoint 2007, there really was only one way to actually do that. You actually had to send it off to another location. So you, when you do a declaration, you send that to another repository. You've got a link on the actual item within the ECB that actually allows you then to send that item to that record center. We can only define out of the box one record center per file, which is somewhat of a limitation. Excuse me. And also the, the data flow regarding that, so actually working out a workflow from a business point of view of how that would work was a complex process. When we're talking about protection, when we're saying sending to the record center, that document is then sent into a records repository. That record repository then has all the access control applied to it once it's actually got to the other location. What do you then do if you've got a copy of that document in another location? How do you protect that document as well? Retention rules, so actually how do you define this? So you've got policies, and this was quite a disparate process in 2007, and we're going to have a look at some of the features in 2010 that will kind of bring that all together. So when we were looking at uh, the file plan in 2007, we were looking at a routing table. No hierarchy, so we're only looking at document library folders where we're going to place these in. The metadata inheritance from the folders. That, uh, there was a lot of guys probably in this room that ended up doing custom solutions to start to fit some of these elements that their business users were actually asking for. Um, so for instance, one of those is custom folder types. So you create a custom folder type, either associated workflow, an event handler against that. No ability to route to folders, so you could actually route to a top-level folder, but you couldn't go any further than that. So what's changed in 2010? So when we're looking at 2010, we've kind of got some key features here. There's the document ID service, so that when we send a document into a record repository or even a document management area, we can define an ID for that record that will then be stamped with that record for the lifetime of the record. We've got centralized taxonomy management. So when we're looking at this, we're thinking about kind of the uh, metadata management service. Content organized rules. So this is a big, big benefit within 2010, the uh, ability to go through and define rules within a list. That list can then be controlled by your power users. So 
I'm guessing you guys probably don't want to be getting involved every time a legislative change comes in, so therefore you have to come in as a developer, change some code so that it now fits with the actual requirements of the business again. So we're going to be running through some of the content organized routing, hierarchical file plans. So we'll be concentrating on what we mean by a hierarchy and how we're generating these hierarchical file plans. The new multi-stage retention policies. So it used to be that you defined a retention policy and you might have to have a separate workflow that then did some other elements against it, but now we can actually define the multiple levels of what happens with a record once it's gone into a, into a repository. And there's the in-place record declaration. So it's not just the um, archive approach where we send it to a different location. We can now manage records in place. So looking at how that will change the way that we manage our records management system. So document uh, identifiers. Every document can have a unique ID. We've got the ability to reference these documents by ID, and when we get to the demo, we'll be having a look at that, so we can actually see that we can actually get to a document specifically by ID. Um, some of the records managements probably do think of documents on an ID level rather than necessarily think about where it is. We can actually move records and documents without breaking any links as well. So once we move that document from one site collection, because it's already been tagged with that document ID, will actually be ensuring that it maintains that document ID. So it's scoped to the site collection as well. So initially, when you start generating your document IDs, and we'll go off and have a look at how we activate these features, these document ID fields are actually uh, added to each of the uh, document libraries within the site collection, and we'll have a look at the administration of that. But it's all scoped at a site collection level at the administration of this. Uh, another idea uh, element here is we've actually got an example of a site collection URL and the uh, layouts location where we've got the uh, document ID redirection. When we actually go off and do a search on this, we can actually see how this would work. So we're actually making a call to this page and then that will return the relevant documents for us. So content organizer. Again, I was saying that this was a, a large area of uh, investment for Microsoft. Uh, essentially, this is a metadata-driven routing table that you can define, and it's actually defined just by list items. And this allows people to go in, control their file, their file plan appropriately. They can target destination folders, and those folders can be subfolders. So you can start to work out kind of like four, five-level file plans that can actually allow you to define the actual uh, information management policies at those levels as well, based on the content types. Centralized taxonomy management, so looking at the managed metadata service. So previously in 2007, we had to sync up our content types across different site collections or different web applications in order to get the routing to work appropriately. We don't have to do that now. There's this managed metadata service where we can define our content types at an enterprise level. Those content types will then be pushed across each one of those site collections so that they can be used in each of the site collections so you can define your the content types that you want to use within your document management areas and then use exactly the same content types within your record centers so that you can define how that routing can work. Uh, it's also the, the, the big feature as well around here is the hierarchical managed uh, metadata service. So actually when you uh, define your metadata, it's hierarchical. Obviously when we were looking in 2007, that was a flat structure. Being able to define uh, continent, country, office location, for instance, we can start to do those sort of things, which is obviously an incredibly powerful tool. So what we've got here is we've actually got a, uh, an example of a content organizer rule. As I was saying, it's a, a list item, and this is the form that we'd actually be going through and uh, modifying to actually create our rules. When we get through into the demo, we'll actually go through and use this and we'll generate some rules and we can actually see those content being put into the relevant locations based on the metadata that they've got. So when we're talking about sending to sites, I, I, previously you set up a single record center. That record center was defined at a farm level. What you then do is you then say, for this farm, I want my record center to be over here. That's no longer the case in 2010. What we have is we have the ability to define um, send to locations. 
So we can actually set up locations and say, well, for this web application, I want to use these record centers. And it doesn't have to be one. You could have multiple record centers underneath there. And that's within central admin, we can actually go through and have a look at how well I've got some of these send to um, connections configured. OK, so when we're looking at folder partitioning, so we can actually start to say, well, actually, I want a number of items within a folder. So when we're looking at the actual records repositories where these um, records end up, then we can say, well, actually, I want there to be a certain number of items within a single folder so that I have better management over that. And then once I've got to that le level of uh, items, I want, want to create a new folder. And we can do that by date as well, which is obviously quite powerful. So you know, in financial terms, you'd be looking at wanting to do it within a single financial year, for instance. Uh, within here, you can define your own naming schemes as well. So part of the content organizer rules allow us to set up what we actually want these folders to be created and the names associated with them. Not a really big area as well is the preservation of context, so we can actually move audit information with the documents as well. So th again, in 2007, what we ended up with was XML files associated with that document, and then you have to manage now maybe not one record, but three records with the previous data about that. That now all comes across with the record as a single entity as well. Also, what we had in 2007 when we looked at versioning was we'd actually append a unique ID onto the end of the document. So when you're looking at the document, you'd have document name and a unique identifier. You did not have the ability to use SharePoint versioning. We now can create new versions within 2010, so we can actually just use the out-of-the-box SharePoint versioning, which is obviously more powerful when we want to go through and actually have a look at those versions. We can define rule managers, uh, the content organizers. So where we actually generate these content organizers, we can start to say, well, actually, we want to delegate the management of this content out to these rule managers. So this is what I was talking about when it comes to records management. They can come through, define their file plan. It's not your responsibility to be going in, changing these rules for them. They can be devolved and actually have the permissions to go off and do that themselves. A uh, key element on here is they also need the ma manage website permission as well, so it's not just the rule managers group that they need to be added to. Uh, the other element here is that obviously uh, it still uses the uh, concept of a drop-off library, so that you would actually uh, send documents into the record center and they would initially be placed into a drop-off library. You can now go through and create content organizer rules that work retrospectively so that we can actually generate a content organizer rule that will go through and look at the drop-off library and then associate it into the relevant location within the file plan. So when we're talking about file plans, what do we actually mean in SharePoint terms? So when we talk about a file plan, we're talking about the content organizer, the rules that we generate for that. The hierarchy are the folder structures that we create down within our document libraries. So from a development point of view, this can be a manual process. People could actually go through and set all this up, and that's what I'm going to cover in the IW session later on today. But I'm guessing in large enterprises, people aren't going to want to do that. People are wanting to have most of this configured out of the box for them with features, and that's where I really see the value of you guys coming in modifying this and setting all this up initially and then moving that over to having the records managers take that on and be able to manage it ongoing. So the other elements here is that we don't have to use this just in a record center. It used to be that you generate a record center in 2007, you get all the features that you required for that. We now have a proper feature model around record center so that we can go off, activate features. It doesn't have to be just within one location. So for instance, if you wanted to leverage the content organizer model, you don't have to just use it within the record center. You might want to use it for digital asset management on a completely different topic to records where you actually categorize those uh, media files into the appropriate location, for instance. 
Okay, so what I'm going to do now is we're just going to go through, just kind of cover off some of those topics, have a look at generating content organizer rules, look at the way that uh, some of the timer jobs that run around this. So we've kind of got content organizer that we've discussed. We've also got the document IDs we've discussed. So I'll just bring us into this. Okay. So what we've got here is we've got a normal document management area. It's just a team site that I've generated. I've got some example content within the document library here. Um, what we've got over here is we've actually got our brand new record center. So this is the new record center within 2010. Uh, what we can find here is right up at the top, so this document ID service that we were discussing, this is actually where we can actually define a document ID directly. So um, I think I've got one here. Oh, that won't work. That doesn't exist. Let me just refresh that page. I do apologize. So you couldn't actually find that within here. What I'll do is uh, we've got, uh, you'll be able to go and see the document libraries in a second. We'll actually find one of the uh, IDs that does exist. So we'll just grab that and just show it there. I thought I already had one in there. So once we've got, so we can see we've got the document ID service. We can access a document directly by ID. We could have tens of millions of documents within this library, for instance. So that's an incredibly powerful tool. So now within Site Actions, we have this uh, new uh, Site Action element down at the bottom for Manage Record Center. So we'll just take you into here. So we've now got our common records management tasks. So again, we can be having a look at what we've got uh, with regards to content organizer rules here. So I'm just going to come into the content organizer rule list. I've already gen generated some rules within this um, content organizer already. So you can see that we've actually got um, HR documents, IT documents. I've got some research documents. So these are actually specified, and these will be routing to relevant folders. So if I just open up one of these existing rules now. So here's Content Organizer. Uh, let's just edit that. That gives us a little bit of a better view against it. So having a look in here, we can actually define what content type we want this to work against. So we can actually see that we've got these content type groups. These were actually generated by the Managed Metadata Service. If you guys want to have a look at that later, I'm not going to cover it in the demo, but I've got that all set up here as well. Um, we've defined uh, what group it is. We've defined the content type. And then down here, we have a conditions element. So we've actually defined that uh, we've got a property-based condition. So the org location is equal to HR. Uh, and then what we can do is we can actually then specify where this is going to go. So we, if we want to send it into a uh, folder within the current site collection, what we can do is actually specify it through this browse location, and this will just bring up the current site collection. We do have some other abilities here as well. So we can actually send it to a different location. So we can actually define that actually this record doesn't sit within this record center. If this record comes to this location, what we then want to do is we want to send it to a different record center with a different set of content organizer rules that can then uh, handle that appropriately. So I've actually got some that have already been set up. These have all been set up within Central Admin. I'll show you that shortly as well. So we've got options to actually send this on to different locations. So for instance, we could send this to a different um, record center that I've got set up for research records. I'm just going to cancel that for now. So what I'm going to do is, um, if I just come and have a look at our drop-off library here, we haven't got anything in the drop-off library now. I think this is quite a cool feature, kind of retrospectively going off and looking at how we can actually 
uh, manage documents that don't fall within a current rule set. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come down here and have a look at my management report, just double check the properties. So we've got a demo record one content type defined. We have an org location of management defined. And essentially, what we're now going to do is we're going to send this to the record center. But just quickly show you, we haven't actually currently got a uh, management rule configured. So there is no rule at the moment for defining management documents. So we're going to actually move this to the record center. So there's various different options that you now get in the uh, record center in 2010. You can copy it, you can move it, you can move and link to the document as well. So I'm just going to move it in this particular case. So what we can actually see is when we've set this up, we can say that there is a submission pending. So this hasn't hit any of those content organizer rules that are within that current record center that we've just moved this document to. And we even get the URL that has, it's now set up to. So it's actually within this drop-off library, and it's saying that it needs some uh, administrative um, attention. So now we can actually come in and have a look at our drop-off library. We can see that we've got management report three within here. What I'm now going to do is come back to the content organizer. So I'm going to create a content organizer rule. So if we call this management record, and we're going to define what content type this runs against, and it's demo record one. And we're going to say the property for this is the org location is equal to management. And then what we're going to do is we're going to define the folder within this record center that this is actually going to go into. So I'm opening up the records library. Now we could have multiple uh, locations underneath here. Another key element to actually just, I don't know whether you guys can see that. There's a little padlock kind of at the bottom of uh, this records library. That's defining the elements that were within this library are records. Just a visual representation so that people are aware. So I've now defined the management folder. Now, if we wanted to, we could specify other elements in here so we can actually define um, this is where we're talking about creating folders and how we want to do that. But at the moment, I won't actually configure that. So we've now created a management records um, content organizer rule. What I'm now going to do is I'm just going to open up Central Admin. So um, although if, a, if when routing to a record center and a document matches a rule, it will automatically be picked up and sent to the appropriate location, I'll give you a quick demo of that afterwards. But um, if it's not, then it's actually run by a timer job that's running in the background. So we can still retrospectively go and organize all our content. So for instance, let's say there was 200 documents that had all been submitted that didn't actually match a rule. We don't want to have to manually go through that process and actually say, well, actually, I want this, this content in here. Let me just exit that. So. So what we've got is these content organizer processing jobs. So I'm actually, so I know this is on my SharePoint 80 web application. So I'm just going to open this up now and run it. Make sure that's run. So if I now come back to here and go into my drop-off library, now see that there is no document within the drop-off library. And if we go into the records library and look in the management folder, we should see that management report three has been put in here. And you can also see that this has actually got a record already, a record ID also already associated with it. 
So what we've done is we've retained the document ID that was uh, added to it within the document management system, and it's been pulled across so that throughout the entire enterprise there is a single document ID associated with that document. Okay. What I'll also do is, uh, with regards to document IDs, uh, these are, um, again, time of job, so I'm just going to quickly go and show you these. So you can actually um, specify the content organizer and also the um, document ID service as features within a site collection. These ju can just be activated and deactivated appropriately. Uh, if you activate the document ID service, what you'll find is that um, you have two jobs that manage that. So it will actually go back and again, retrospectively assign document IDs, documents that you've uh, activated that feature against. If you want to run that though, these actually run on a daily basis. So uh, if we just quickly have the, the enable job. So this is set to run at 9 p.m. usually. Uh, if you want to assign document IDs quickly, just remember to go in to your timer jobs, run the document ID, uh, ID enable disable job, and then run the document ID assignment job, because otherwise you'll be wondering why you've not got any document IDs associated with it when you've activated the feature. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly go in and show you the features that we've got that activate these within the site. So these can just be turned on in any type of site. So what we've got here is the document ID service. So this is the, again, just a feature. We can activate, deactivate. And we've also got the content organizer. It's not activated against that one. I'll just show you against this site here. Sorry, that's my fault. It's actually web scopes rather than site collection scope. So the content organizer is uh, available and it can be activated and deactivated. Again, that can be done at any level. So uh, it's just a case of remembering DocuID is uh, site scoped, content organizer is web scoped. Okay. And if we come back to the slides now. Okay, so when we're looking at documents management, it's also not just about going to be where we place these documents and these records within the appropriate location. It's also about how we retain those documents. So within SharePoint, it's an information management policy that actually defines what we're going to do and how we're going to retain those documents. In 2007, you were a bit limited with what you could do. Now in 2010, you have this idea of multi-stage retention. So you can say, I want to do a review every year and I want to purge invoices after three years. So um, what I'll do is I'll give a quick demo of this at the end as well. So here we've got an example of the information management policy stages. This is actually an initial stage. Once you go through, this is the, um, a single stage within it. There's actually a window behind here that defines the multiple levels underneath it. So when we were looking in 2007, the best practice around that was to use metadata, not folders. Now when we're talking about e-discovery, we're looking at kind of using folders rather than and inheriting the metadata. So when we're talking e-discovery, this actually leverages the search technology, so we're going through We've got to have all our content crawled appropriately for e-discovery as well, because obviously what we're doing is when we're going to go off and provide holds against this content, we need to be able to go and find it. So what we've talked up to now is really about the archive approach, which was very similar to what we had within 2007, where we either copy 
the document to a different location. There's obviously the new features around the number of record centers that are supported. However, we can now go through and define within our document management areas that this document is also a record as well. So there's the in-place records management. Cool things around this really are the fact that you can still use all your retention policies, you can define all the information management policies that you would do within the record center itself. The only difference is that now you have to define them on a document library that would have just normal documents in as well. So what does that mean? Um, really, we're looking around how do we actually manage those records in place. So there's the management overhead of saying, well, what do I want this information management policy to apply within the following document library? So do you want it to apply to all documents within there, or do you want it just to apply to the records that are associated with that document library? So it's a big change, this, really, for SharePoint. So we're looking at not just having this uh, multi-tier approach where we have an archive. We can now have management in place and the scaling requirements that this also brings. Because now, rather than having to worry about having an individual silo or multiple silos that support that, you could have hundreds of millions of records defined throughout your entire enterprise, but they're staying in situ. So again, uh, featureization within 2010. So again, this in-place records management is a feature that can be activated. So we're looking at how we go about activate the feature in the site, and therefore that feature is then enabled against all of the document libraries. Again, this is really covering some of the ground that I've already covered. It's all around the fact that you can actually um, define a record and apply holds at those levels. So you can apply custom processing, like the workflows that I was discussing earlier on against an information management policy. So when we actually go through the demo, what we'll do is we'll have a look at those information management policies and we'll have a look at the actions that you can do against those policies. So once we've got to this stage, we want to maybe do a disposition workflow. Maybe we want to do an approval workflow. There's also some really cool stuff around this in terms of what you can do in SharePoint Designer. I know you guys probably don't want to hear SharePoint Designer, but essentially it means that rather than you guys having to come in, write a new workflow in Visual Studio, you can sit there and say, well, you can modify the out-of-the-box workflows yourself using SharePoint Designer, which then means that you guys only get involved when it's actually some really meaty work. So once we've enabled this feature against the site, we then get some additional options coming up against our document libraries. So our document libraries now have the ability to go through and uh, define what you want to do with those documents in there. Are they always going to be uh, records? Can you define records within that library itself? So even though you've activated the feature, it doesn't mean that you will immediately start uh, allowing anybody to declare records anywhere. As long as you've got the appropriate permissions applied within your document management areas, you can say, well, actually, it's only this library that I want to use for records. And these are how you go off and turn these features on and on at a library level. So once we've declared a record, we've got the compliance details. This is quite a nice feature. You can uh, actually go down on the ECB, click on there, and there's a compliance element. It'll tell you whether it's exempt from policy, what's currently happening with that. So you just get a quick overview of that document where it's at within its um, retention lifecycle. So again, document retention, it's actually implemented via these information management policies. Can be applied to any documents, not just records. So when we're looking at this, it's, we can actually go through and say, well, actually, this library, we want this to have all of the documents reviewed. And you can do that by content type as well. So you could sit there and have a specific content type for records and ones that weren't records if you wanted to, if you wanted to find different information management policies against the same library. Legal holds, as I said earlier on, this is actually tied into the search um, sections now. So what we're looking at is how do we go off, find content, and say, well, actually, we want to hold this content. We need to do a legal hold against it. So when we go off and locate all of those documents, what we can do is there's a page that we can actually preview the results and we see which documents we're going to put on a hold that match our current criteria. 
then what we do is we can then have uh, the ability to either keep those documents in situ and apply the hold at that level, or what we can do is we can move them to a different records repository so that that could then be gone through. So for instance, if there were thousands of documents that were required for that litigation, then you can go through and just define that into its own records repository, and then that can be then pushed off to uh, whoever actually needs to go through and review and audit those documents. This can be applied to any type of content as well. So again, we're not talking just records content. So for instance, if there were documents that were kind of superfluous content that uh, backed up what was in some of the records, then you could also find and send those to the record center as well. Uh, Excel is used heavily as well. So what you'll find is that if you want to do auditing or reviews of uh, any of the content within the record center or even at an in-place level, you can go through and using Excel services generate reports that can then be rendered up to you or can be put into document libraries for later use. So this is basically what we were talking about before, so running through associated holes using Excel as a way to generate those reports. Touched on this slightly, but basically what we're looking at is that uh, the there's multiple ways now of looking at record centers. It's no longer the archival approach. We can have distributed repositories with many records in different locations, all managed by search that's then going to go off and surface up that information where you need to find your records when it comes to a litigation element. So we could have tens of millions of documents. We could have actually hundreds of millions of documents supported within SharePoint 2010 now. This is something that John put in but I don't know a lot about, if I'm completely honest. I tried to do some reviewing last night, so I don't really know about the Exchange 2010 abilities with the email archive. I know you can actually email into Content Organizer rules, so essentially you just email enable the record center, you give that an email address, obviously you set up the appropriate things within Active Directory to allow that, if that's what your, your email subsystem is. And then you can email into the record center, and again, given if it's got um, actual metadata associated with that, that can be routed as well. But I don't really know a lot about the Exchange 2010 stuff, so if you do want to know about that, I'm quite happy to take questions on it, but I'll have to take that one away. So in summary, so where were we before? So where, what, what's SharePoint 2010 given us? So we've now got these new content organizer rules. Hopefully what we're seeing is that you guys have less work to do. So it's not just the case of you coming in and having to do everything with regard to file plans, event handlers. We've got a lot of this new stuff out the box that we can leverage and it's really when you need to come in is when it's a little bit more in depth than that and the configuration at an upfront level to get these information management policies in. So you, know, you wanna be able to define features that'll go off and set all of these file plans up set up your hierarchies, and then once that's all in place, then you can push all of that over to your records management, and they can then take that on and then manage it for you. It's the in-place records management. So uh, John actually finishes this deck here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you guys another demo. So I'm actually gonna go through, actually have a look at the in-place records management features, having a look at some of the information management policy stuff as well. So if I just come out of this deck quickly. So I've actually got a, um, a different record center set up here. Um, what I've actually done on this one is I've actually generated some additional libraries as well. So if you wanted to, you can still use libraries to define where you want content to go. You could just use a single library. It just depends how you want to break that up and what works within your organization. Um, what I'm going to go through is just having a look at what we've got with regards to information management policies within this site. So if I go to library settings, then go to the information management policy settings, So what we can see here is that we've actually defined a custom policy against a content type. So what we've got here is this uh, record to content type. And what you can start to see here is that we've enabled retention against this content type within this library. We've decided that uh, 
for every two years, we want to start a disposition workflow. So do we need to do this? But legislation says that after 20 years, no matter what we do with this content, we need to delete it. So there's the ability to permanently delete as well. Um, what I'll do actually is let's just delete this. So w obviously we've already got one stage. What we're now going to do is go in and add in another retention stage. So we can then define what we want to do to this. So we've got some quite... Um, so we, we've actually got some quite good features within here. It's quite robust against what we can do. So we can define what we want to do against the time period for this, when it was created, when it was declared a record. When we're talking about in-place records management, that's probably a really good thing because it won't have been created at that point. Don't forget, uh, creation date in an in-place organization won't actually be the day that that document got created because it will be the date that it's declared a record. So we're actually within an archival approach here. So I'm actually going to define for every five years and then um, we can either transfer to another location. Maybe we want to put it on cheaper storage. Um, we can actually then uh, do various other elements against here. Uh, we can start a workflow. This is incredibly powerful. So we could actually do um, our own custom workflows against here. One thing to be aware of is that when you do want to start defining workflows, the workflows need to be associated with the library for them to appear in here. So again, this is where I think you guys can really come in. So when people want all these custom workflows, they're going to be as need to be associated with the libraries. And that's where they want those configurations to be set up initially. So those workflows need to be associated with the libraries first. So uh, we, we, you can see the power of this with being able to go through, add in additional retention pay, uh, stages based on the um, legislation that applies to your organization. Okay. What I'll then do is if I uh, come back here into my document management area, what we can see here is that I've actually got some in place records already, and you've actually got a visual representation of uh, this uh, content. So we can actually see that we've got a record that's defined within the library. Um, what we can also do is I can go through the process of uh, declaring this as a record. So if I just select this, I don't try to open it. And we have this new option up at the top. So Part of the library settings that I've enabled against this shared document library is that we can enable uh, manually generate records. So if I just uh, declare this as a record, we can actually see that this has been declared a record now. So I've actually got a declared record field that's been added for us. I'm then just going to quickly go and have a look at the compliance details against this. So we've got an ability to go through and actually have a look as a quick view against what's going on. So we know whether it's exempt from uh, policy or not. We can see whether it's on hold currently. Uh, we can undeclare the record if we've got the appropriate permissions or it's not on a hold. And additionally, we've got the ability to go in and uh, have a look at these audit reports as well. So we've, uh, we can see that we can actually generate reports straight out of here. I've got a problem on this build of mine, so this isn't working, so I won't show you that. But um, essentially, these are the other features that we've gone through, and I'll just kind of give you a quick review of that. Let's just pull this up. And I guess the next thing to say is, have you guys got any questions? Yes? A page is a record. Uh, it's a good question. Um, Yes, it would be uh, within that role because you could use the in-place records management feature to do that, I believe. Uh, what, what's the business case around that? If you have a um, financial website, then there's information that's been deposited that is Okay. Okay. So we're moving away from kind of like the document structure that we've had kind of previously rather than kind of somebody downloading a PDF or something. It's going to be a case that you're delivering content on the web, and it's how that is then going to be a record, yeah? Yeah, uh, potentially, I, I would have thought the... I'd have to double-check it completely, but certainly the in-place records management features, I think you'd be able to leverage that. Uh, 
uh, it won't alert you. So if, you, if you've got the um, record actually enabled, it will stop you from deletion. So it kind of goes from item level upwards. Um, I haven't tried it at site level. I've tried it at a document library level. But um, we could, yeah. I, I'm, I know that it ripples from item to document library. So um, it's worth testing. I'll say that much. But I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it should all ripple up, yeah. Uh, so I think this gentleman behind me. But I'll come to you next. Sorry. Fortunately, the, that, that's what the product groups have started to think about as well. So yes, you are right, if you did want to do all those. And that's why the search um, framework has been used around this. So once it's been declared a record, then what you need to do is be crawling all your content. And then that feeds into the e-discovery process. So that's how it gets away from that resource intensive going off and finding all the records in all these disparate locations. We're just leveraging the search framework that's already in place in order to be able to do that. Sorry, I think. So, uh, information management policies, you want to be able to apply to a document set? Yes. In a word? No, uh, you can do. You can even send document sets to record centers as well, which is a really powerful tool. So, you can actually go through, generate your document sets. In the IW demo uh, later on today, that's what I'll be doing, kind of showing, kind of generating document sets. So, for instance, if you're going through an RFP process and you want the whole set of documents that are associated with that process, and then you want to be able to retain that for contractual <coughs> reasons, then i will kind of do a demo against that. So, yes, completely possible. Yes, you, sir. Yes, so uh, the, the, the best practice around 2007. Yeah. It is, you're, you're correct. And the, the way around that really is, is the, uh, the metadata you should still be there. So even within that, you're saying about um, using the metadata. Really, although we are switching it, what we want to do is create an, probably a, a file plan using the content organizer rules and the hierarchies underneath that. But then the metadata that we've got associated with it, we can then um, just move with it with the, um, that's already associated with those records. No, so the, the, the metadata that you've already got associated with the records and that you've already got in place, obviously that will follow through. What you probably have to look at is your new folder hierarchy and the file plan that you want to associate with that and leveraging the content organizer rules to be able to apply it. So the question was, if we search on metadata, will we be able to find the documents associated <coughs> with that metadata? Yes, completely. So again, because we're leveraging search, what you might need to do if you're creating custom fields or cross some uh, metadata, uh, metadata properties within uh, the managed metadata service, then you might have to go into search and define those as um, custom columns. So within the actual search administration, you can sit there and say, I want these managed metadata properties. So if you wanted custom columns, you can do that, but you've just got the overhead of creating them within the search administration. Oh, sorry. So you want to generate a reusable policy? Yeah. Yes, completely. So those information management policies, although I've been generate them at a library level, you can go through and generate them. You can actually generate them as features. So for instance, you could actually uh, create a information management policy that is associated with a majority of your company. And then you can go through and associate that to the appropriate libraries already, again, by feature activation. 
So you could generate information management policies at a top level and then filter those down. So is that, that your question? Uh, yeah, completely. And I do understand where you're coming from that. I think w what we've done here is we've demoed and we've shown how this thing can be done. And what you do, in fact, in the next session I do from IW, it's got a lot of governance elements within that, kind of discussing how you want to go through and do this and all the upfront planning that are associated with it. Um, records management really is kind of... Uh, start of project heavy in my mind it's really about going through and say what we need to do here is say well we've got these folders and these are going to have uh, the following retentions applied to them and you need to know all that stuff up front before going and doing any form of um, implementation of this so th there's a heavy design phase beforehand Yes, indeed. I'd like, to, I'd like to see information management policy defined in terms of the content. And then I don't care where the content's stored, the information policy should apply. You can do that at a site collection level. So at a site collection level, you can define that. So uh, what you saw there were custom policies that are defined at a library level. You have the ability to create site collection policies as well. So that site collection policy can then apply to a content type. So at a site collection level, you said that everything that comes in to this site collection, so you could do that as in an archival approach, you'd see that working quite well in a record center. And then any content type that comes in will then have that information applied, and you can stop people from then going through and modifying that as well. So is that applied from a content perspective? Is it applying in place? <coughs> um, it, you could do it in place as well. Uh, the difficulty with in place, so it's like everything, um, there's always trade-offs. Basically, if you do it in place, what you could be using is you could have a uh, content type that's used for other things. So do you necessarily want that information management policy to apply to that content type, which could be applied to multiple different, um, in multiple different libraries, not all of them being records? Okay. Well, I mean, we, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's completely configurable with regards to that. It's, it, it just depends how you want to define your governance model and doing all the design and planning that works within your organization. Excellent. Hopefully that answers the question. If you want any more, uh, and this goes for everybody, if uh, anybody wants any more deep dive kind of information on this or have a look at the demo itself, I'm over in the Microsoft corner in the uh, top right of uh, floor three, so please do come and find me. And uh, basically, I try and help you out as best I can. Many thanks. <laughs>